This presentation is produced by Catholic Education Ballarat and is designed to explore raw scores, scale scores, percentiles and stainines and how these scores might be used to inform our teaching and inform school improvement. At the end of the presentation, there's a bonus feature which explores error margin in standardised tests. A raw score is simply an individual's actual achievement on an assessment, 8 out of 10 or 56 out of 80. Raw scores can compare students who set the same test. They can also measure growth if a child sits the exact same test over time. The limitations are that raw scores cannot be used to compare students' progress across different tests, nor do raw scores give an indication of the progress of a child relative to the population or their year level. Raw scores do not go onto referrals in isolation. Here's an example of a set of students who undertook an assessment with the following raw scores. As you can see, we can compare the students against each other. Subsequently, the students sat a different test the following year. We cannot compare these two tests. We can't make any statements as to whether the children are making progress or not. Which leads us to a scale score. Now a scale score is the converted raw score onto one consistent scale. For example, 25 out of 30 on one test might be equivalent to 15 out of 35 on a much harder test. Using a scale score, we can measure growth over time and comparisons can be made across different tests in the same series. Limitations are that the scale score does not show where a child sits relative to the population. Scale scores only apply for a particular test. For example, the PAT-R scale cannot be compared with the PAT-M scale. Nor could a NAPLAN maths score be compared to a NAPLAN writing score. Scale scores also do not go on referrals in isolation. Here's our sample set of students again, and you can see that their raw scores have been, con been converted to the following scales. And in the subsequent year, we can see that Kate has made some growth. So has Mon, Sue seems to have plateaued, and Matt also seems to have made some growth. Using the scale scores, we can see whether or not children have made growth. But what we can't see with the scale score is where those children sit relative to their year level or the norm sample. Here is the actual scale scores from the PAT maths. Now these scale scores are for the child or children at exactly the 50th percentile or the average. If you have a look at the growth between year one and two, you can see that it's about 10 scale score points. However, when we get up to year six and seven and beyond, the growth is only about three scale score points. Percentiles. Now, percentiles show the child's score relative to children of a similar age or the norm sample. An ATAR is a percentile score. We can use percentiles to measure growth. We can also use percentiles to flag students in need of extension and further support. Percentiles do go on referrals. All external professionals will interpret this number regardless of their familiarity with the particular test. Percentiles are not diagnostic. They do not help identify specific areas of difficulty. Here's our sample students again, and you can see now we're starting to get a much fuller picture. Kate, with a scale score of 93, achieved a percentile score of 17, which means she is achieving equal to or better than 17% of the population. Mon 
is working in the bottom third of the population. Sue, in the top third of the population, and Matt, well, he's almost in the top 10% of the population. If we look at their subsequent test, we can get some interesting information. As you can see, Kate has made progress. Her scale score has improved from 93 to 98. However, her percentile has slipped back slightly. Now this shows that although Kate has made progress, she is not progressing as quickly as the rest of the children of her age group. Similarly for Mon, although she's making progress, she has slipped back significantly in the percentile rankings, meaning that the rest of the students have made far greater growth than Mon. That is the same case for Sue, and Matt seems to be making progress relative to himself and also the norm sample. The percentiles are used to develop the stainines. Now stainines are simply groups of percentiles and they're a way of looking at large cohorts or large numbers of students and grouping their percentiles together. Now there are nine stay nines. They are the standard nine stay nines. The bottom stay nine, stay nine one, is from 0% to the fourth percentile. So a child in stay nine one is achieving in the bottom 4% of the population. It simply mirrors this at the top end. You can see from the 96th percentile on is stay nine nine. So those children stay nine nine are achieving equal to or greater than 96% of the population. Stay nine two goes from the fourth percentile to the 11th. Stay nine three from the 11th to the 23rd. So children who are achieving in stay nines one, two and three are achieving in the bottom 23%, the bottom quartile. Similarly, children achieving in stay nine seven, eight and nine are achieving in the top 23%. Stay nine four is particularly interesting as it moves from the 23rd percentile to the 40th. So a child who's at the bottom end of stay nine four could in fact be on the 24th percentile. At the top end, they could be at the 40th percentile. So that's quite a range. Similarly, children in the fifth percentile are going, sorry, the fifth stay nine are going from the 40th to the 60th percentile. That is quite wide. Now, there are 4% of people in the last percentile, the first percentile, but 20% of the population in that fifth percentile. As you can see, the stay nines are distributed across the bell curve. So how do we use stay nines? Stay nines are useful for grouping students. They are useful for tracking the progress of cohorts and large numbers of students. In large groups, we can easily see the spread of students. We can flag groups of students for further investigation. And we can track progress of the groups over time. But I must stress, we don't use stay nines to track the progress of individuals. Stay nines are broad and there are degrees within them. Stay nines do not go onto referrals as they are such a broad measure. Here's an example of how one school uses stay nines to track school improvement. This school, using the PADAR data from 2014 to 2019, have tracked how many students are at stay nines one to three, they've grouped those together, four, five, six, and seven to nine. And using this last column, they've identified what percentage of students are at or above 
stay 9.5. And we can see here that that number is tracking in the 70s and just dipped below in 2019. They've used this number to generate their targets for 2020. Now, sitting behind this uh, whole school data, of course, is individual cohort data, and then behind that, individual student data. But as you can see, data like this is a good way of tracking school progress using stay nines. Let's have a look at our, or one of our sample students. I've chosen mine. As you can see, her percentile ranking of 33 dropped her into stay nine number four. But do you remember that Mon dropped back to percentile 24 in the second year of testing? However, stay, percentile of 24 leaves Mon in stay nine four. Now, Mon has dropped back considerably against her cohort but her stay nine has stayed the same. And this is a really good example of why using stay nines to track individual progress is inappropriate. Now this table shows the PAT scale scores for PAT M at the different percentiles. Let me just talk you through it. So we've seen this column before earlier, and this is the scale scores of the children at the 50th percentile. This column here shows the scale scores of the children at the 25th, the 5th, 75th, and 95th. Let's have a look at a child on the 25th percentile in year three, sitting at 101. That's almost equivalent to being average at year two. So we could say that this child in year three is in fact a year behind where they should be based on their scale score in year three being equivalent to at standard in year two. Similarly, let's look at this child with a scale score of 127 in year four on the 75th percentile that is equivalent to average in year six. So we can say based on this test that this child is two years ahead of expectation. Now, of course, we need to triangulate that with some other evidence before uh, reporting. But a table like this will show the expected growth and also be able to help us make some comparisons as to where children are sitting relative to the general population. So that winds it up for this part of the presentation. Uh, and I'm now moving on to confidence band or error margins. So let's have a look at confidence band and error margin. This is particularly important for children at um, extremes on their testing. Now, all test scores have an associated margin of error. These margins of error are often expressed as a plus or a minus or a particular value or sometimes shading or dotted lines on diagrams. You may have seen uh, a reading age of seven years with a confidence band of 6.9 to 7.3. Sometimes you might see a scale score of 107 with plus or minus five. On our PAT testing, we end up with the children's individual test diagrams looking like this. The dotted line is the child's scale score, but the shaded band is the confidence band, meaning that the child has achieved this scale score, but PAT are confident that they're in here somewhere. Now let's have a look at what that means in practice. Here's a, a dummy account that's been set up by the Catholic, for the Catholic Education Office. And so the children here are, um, although the data is real, the children's names are, are not correct. So this is a year four reading test. 
And let's have a look at Rosa here. Now, Rosa has scored 28. She came out with a very high scale score. Her percentile is 98th percentile and with a stay nine of nine. If I click on Rosa, her test actually pops up and I can um, recalibrate it to question difficulty. So the green dots are items that she answered correctly and the red square there, only one of them, is the item that Rosa answered incorrectly. Now, interestingly, this item that she answered incorrectly was at a difficulty rating of scale score 129.3. So the hardest question Rosa got right was at a difficulty of 128. And yet her scale score has come out at 150. Now, let's have a look. Her scale score is here at 150. But this confidence band is about 142 to 158. So that's a range of 16 scale score points. Now, if you remember that at about year four, children are only growing by about five scale score points. So for Rosa, this test is showing that, yes, she is quite high, but the testing for her, it just isn't accurate enough to say exactly how high she is. So she's somewhere between 142 and 160, coming out at 150.3. So that error margin is really wide. Let's have a look at someone else. I'm going to go down into a middle score here. And let's have a look at Ira. Wow, look at her. She's right on the 50th percentile, so absolutely average. Again, I'll just reconfigure her test into question difficulty. And you can see here she's got um, a lot of and items answered correctly, but quite a few answered incorrectly as well, some above and some below the line there. Ira's its scale score has come out here at 119.1. And can you see here that the error margin is a lot narrower? This test is much more accurate for Ira because she's got more items incorrect. And that scale score seems to be sitting between 123 and 117. So if her confidence band is only six points wide, whereas the earlier one was in fact 16 points wide. So as children are sitting tests that are more appropriate for them, the tests become more accurate and that error margin becomes less precise. Now the error margin in fact means that the child could sit you know, a similar test two days apart and be staying within that error margin at either end of it. So what does that mean for us? Well, it, it simply means that small differences in scores shouldn't be given more importance than they deserve. It also means that we need to be mindful of the error margin when we're making judgments. We need to be aware that the error margin, the margin of error is greater at the extremes of the raw score results. And tests with large error margins should be done less frequently as they're not precise enough to measure small increments. We also need to be mindful that people at the extremes, we may need to do some follow-up testing to get a more accurate result. So that concludes this presentation. For more information, please contact your education officer.